everybody and welcome to this special O anniversary sign for I in celebration of Richard Owen's uh, 211th birthday. Now if you don't know me, I'm Sarah Vincent, I'm from the Library and Archives and I'm the sci-fi rep from the Library and Archives. And I'm very happy today to introduce our speaker for this month, Carolyn Schindler. Um, Carolyn is uh, an author, she wrote Discovering Dorothea, Dorothea, um, sorry, Discovering Dorothea, a biography of Dorothea Bate that came out in 2005. Um, that was actually the first time she encountered the museum in our library and archives collections, but she must have liked us because she's, she's still here now, working as a scientific associate with the library and archives. Um, in the years that she's been working with us, she's a regular contributor to Evolve. She um, often shares stories of the characters that she's met you know, through her journeys in the archives and shares them with us all. Uh, in her professional background, she used to work as a journalist. She was a political journalist for the BBC. And not to spoil the contents of any of tonight's talk, but I think the people of Westminster could probably learn a few things about machinations by looking at our archives. Um, but yeah, so very much looking forward to it. Carolyn, over to you. Sarah, thanks very much. And good afternoon. In the mid 19th century, Richard Owen was, for the press, the public, politicians, and many, though not all, of his colleagues, quite simply, the greatest living naturalist and that splendid genius. That was how the future Prime Minister William Gladstone described him in Parliament. Pre-Darwin, Owen dominated natural science. Owen was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society at the age of 30, was a renowned lecturer, became a brilliant comparative anatomist, he was known as the British Cuvier, and was tutor in science to the royal family. He was advisor to governments, reported on environmental health matters, and was of course responsible in 1842 for immortally describing and naming the order of great extinct lizards, dino, fearful, terrible, strange, wondrous, saurus, lizard. Over the next 40 years, Owen named 18 of the British dinosaurs now known, and that's about 20% of the total that were listed in a paper in 2007. Richard Owen was on the organizing committee for the Great Exhibition of 1851, and in 1854, for the sculptor Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, Owen bought the Victorians, a sort of Jurassic to Pleistocene Park, the fabulous monsters in Crystal Palace, which you can still see today. And there are about 30 reconstructions of 14 different species. And here are some of them actually under construction in early 1854, and you can see the Hylosaurus. Uh, a pterodactyl and iguanodon, but maybe not quite as we know him today. But we're so used to reconstructions, CGI and the rest of it, that it's too easy to forget the wonderment with which these magnificent monsters were greeted by Victorian visitors to the Crystal Palace. Owen was responsible for naming an astonishing number of creatures new to science and describing animals as diverse as the moa, Dinornis, the gorilla, megatherium, the duck-billed platypus, the eye eye, and the pearly nautilus. He was fascinated by anatomy, by the form, function, and structure of animals, fossil and recent. He published more than 600 books and papers, an extraordinary achievement. He received more than 100 awards, and happily for us, was the prime mover behind the creation of this museum. He even forensically examined a bullet used in the murder of a policeman and proved the identity of the killer. And this incidentally was a notorious burglar called Charles Peace, whose father was a one-legged lion tamer. Peace was hanged for another murder in February 1879, but shortly before his execution, he admitted to the murder of the policeman, for which someone else had already been found guilty and hanged, and it was the bullet used in this case that Owen examined, comparing it with a test bullet fired from Peace's revolver, and he linked the two. He was also an avid reader of popular fiction, especially Dickens, whom he knew well, and he loved going to the theatre. Richard Owen was a fascinating, maddening, brilliant, and contradictory character. He alienated many, and the scale of his success aroused jealousy and fear there are occasions when he's accused of not crediting the work of others. There were public and un unedifying disputes, and he could be deeply wounding in his critique and anonymous reviews. This is Owen's infamous review of On the Origin of Species, 
which fractured forever his relationship with Charles Darwin. Capable of writing with admirable clarity, Owen could obscure his meaning in convoluted, dense, and obscure paragraphs. But he's even been accused of being too snobbish to involve himself in the arduous, dirty business of excavating for fossils, when in fact, Owen's world was the laboratory and the museum. And it's these negative aspects of his personality that have come down to us, and they've de deliberately been used to obscure his outstanding achievements. The anti-Owen agenda was, of course, set by Charles Darwin and his supporters. In his private letters, Darwin refers to that beggar Owen, and that's a phrase repeated time and again. But Owen is also that devil, and also that canting humbug. <laughs> and by the 1870s, Darwin says, I used to be ashamed of hating him so much but now I will carefully cherish my hatred and contempt to the last day of my life. All this Darwin said privately to his friends. In January 1861, he writes to the man who became known as Darwin's bulldog, the biologist Thomas Henry Huxley, who I suppose you could characterize as a sort of Alistair Campbell figure for Darwin. And he said, I shall make no comments. I am not bold enough and do not want to come to open quarrel. That Darwin left to others to do for him. And as many have said before me, Darwin won the argument over evolution and his supporters wrote the history. Not only did Owen lose the argument, but he had no champions. His only son died before he did. His grandchildren had no interest in science and Owen lived so long, he outlasted all his supporters. Richard Owen, a man who was unbelievably hardworking, undeniably brilliant and successful, certainly ambitious, certainly with flaws, and with the same emotions and foibles as the rest of humanity, was turned into a sort of monster. If the bibliographer and geologist Charles Davis Sherburn had not been asked by Owen's family in the 1890s to organize Owen's papers, his vast and invaluable archive might have been lost as well. In fact, such was the sidelining of Richard Owen that when, in the 1960s, his granddaughter, Frances Herzl, and there she is in the middle, don't you like the hats, offered three volumes of his correspondence, that's about 500 letters, to this museum, to this museum, the offer was refused. And she gave the volumes to an American university instead. Um, and that's Francis's daughter, June Cook, there. And um, that lucky man is the director of libraries at Temple University in Pennsylvania, who now have, who now have the letters. It's amazing to such an exceptional character with such a remarkable resource available that while there are many chapters and articles written about Owen, particularly in the last 30 years or so, which do go a long way towards rehabilitating his reputation, in the 120 years since Owen's death, there have been only two full-length biographies about him, and even one of those isn't really a biography. The first, by Owen's grandson, the Reverend Richard Starkin Owen, published in 1894, gives invaluable information about his background, but it plays down Owen's science and the row with Darwin. The extensive quotes, though, from letters and diaries now lost are terrific for people like me. <coughs> Wanting to reflect something of Owen's scientific standing, Richard Starton Owen, unbelievably, and you really couldn't make this up, went to Owen's archbeta, Thomas Henry Huxley. Huxley and Owen had not spoken for 30 years before Owen's death and agreed on absolutely nothing at all. And in reply to the invitation, Huxley replied rather bemusedly, I was never in your grandfather's house, nor he in mine and I doubt if we met in polite society more than half a dozen times. However, he did agree to write it, and he contributed a 60-page scientific appraisal in which he tries to be balanced and is not ungenerous. A hundred years later, in 1994, another book devoted to Owen was published by Nicholas Rupka, and many of you may know it. It's an excellent review of Owen as a naturalist, and it's well worth reading. But what it doesn't do 
is give you any sense of who Owen was. His wife Caroline, for example, has just one entry in the index, and you can see it there with the arrow. Even the briefest glance in any library shows the endless shelves devoted to Darwin, far outstripping the literature on Owen. There is even a Mrs. Charles Darwin recipe book in print, and if you think I'm joking, this is it. Owen's wife Caroline kept what must have been a marvellous diary, judging by the extracts used in the grandson's biography. But the diary itself has vanished, and it must have been a series of diaries because quite a lot of them do uh, turn up in, in the biography. They were last known of in America more than 20 years ago, and let's not even think about her recipe book. When you think of Owen's outstanding achievements, all this is even more extraordinary. He is the man of whom the Times in 1856 could write, than Professor Owen, there is not a more distinguished man of science in the country. So, was Richard Owen one of those irritatingly precocious children who from the age of about six months are clearly going to be brilliant? Well, not exactly, or not according to, according to Owen's schoolmaster, who said he was lazy and impudent and would come to a bad end. Richard Owen was born in Lancaster, in Thurnham Street, on, the, on July the 20th, 1804. The youngest of six children, his father was a merchant in the West Indies, and his mother, who was of Huguenot descent, was the daughter of a church organist. When he was five, his father died, and it was from his mother, as Owen acknowledged, that he received his early training and musical talent. At six, he was sent to Lancaster Grammar School, until his mid-teens, according his, to his sister, he was very small and slight and exceedingly mischievous, imagine that, and hardly grew at all. The family was not poor, but unlike Darwin, for instance, he had no private means and he needed to earn a living. In August 1820, when he was just 16, and by then apparently a big awkward lad, he was apprenticed to a local surgeon apothecary and man midwife. He learned the, uh, the art of dissection on the bodies of convicts who died in Link Lancaster prison, which then occupied the castle. Though his first experience of this, he found so horrifying that he had to repeat to himself almost as a mantra, men must be dissected, men must be dissected. The paralyzing terror he experienced, as he later admitted, was because, as he said, I then believed in ghosts. In 1824, Owen went as a medical student to Edinburgh University, where the eminent anatomy teacher, Dr. John Barclay, gave private lectures. And this is Owen's ticket for the lectures. 70 years later, Charles Davis Sherburn found it in Owen's archive. Owen was at Edinburgh for just six months, and so impressed Barclay that he suggested that Owen should continue his studies at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. He wrote a letter of recommendation to the distinguished surgeon, Dr. John Abernethy, who took on Owen as a preceptor for his lectures to dissect the corpses for his anatomical demonstrations, which were probably in a room just like this. Owen's mother, meanwhile, she was a bit of a helicopter mum, was active on Richard's behalf, writing to an influential cousin that Richard was everything a parent could want, and suggesting that if he spoke a word, and she wrote, in favour to the professors he's about to attend in London, it may be highly advantageous to him. She was also concerned about the hazards of Richard's profession, and when you look at this, that's not surprising. And she urged him to take every precaution against infection. He had at the time an inflamed thumb. And she told him to make a point of washing your face, neck, arms, hands, etc., every night before you enter your bed, and your hands as often as possible while in the dis dissecting room, because as the weather becomes warmer, the danger will be greater. And she adds, probably like every parent today, P.S. You will let us know when you want money. After a year in 1826, Owen took and passed his medical exams and was accepted as a member of the Royal College of Surgeons. He set up a medical practice near to the college, which was in Lincoln's Inn Fields. 
It was through Abernethy, then president of the Royal College of Surgeons, that Owen took on the role that was to shape his life. The college housed the collection of the surgeon and collector John Hunter. It was an extraordinary cornucopia of human and zoological specimens that were not only not catalogued, but in many cases bore no labels and there was little documentation. The conservator of the Hunterian, of the Hunterian Museum, William Clift, was assisted by his son, William Home Clift, but he urgently needed more help, and Owen's skills were just what was required. On March the 6th, 1827, Owen, then 22, began work at the Hunterian as assistant conservator on a salary of 30 pounds a quarter, while still practicing as a doctor. In his first week, he examined a collection of British insects, dissected the larynx of a horse, and dissected part of the spinal column of a man who'd been shot. He also attended visitors, and the figure there is meant to be Owen showing visitors round the museum. His work was nothing if not diverse. He had long conversations with Clift on the history and organization of the Hunterian. He recorded in a notebook which gives a sense of a museum in confusion and Clift paddling desperately to keep up. But it was here Owen made his reputation and where he remained until 1856. He became literally part of the family. As a young man, Owen was good looking, tall and slim. He was about six foot with a high forehead. The historian Thomas Carlyle was struck by his great glittering eyes and said he'd learnt more from Owen than from almost any other man. The diarist Caroline Fox remarked that Owen's face was full of energetic thought and quiet strength. She also wrote that he was very delightful, how she admired his vigorous energy, that he was never ashamed of the science which he so ardently loved, and that he was passionately fond of scenery. William Clift also had a daughter, Caroline Amelia, she seems to have been a woman of great intelligence, humor, and patience. She was also a skilled illustrator. And this does sound a little like a romantic novel, but they fell, fell in love around September 1827, after Caroline fell from a stepladder while hanging a pair of bell pulls, and she was nearly knocked out. Owen, who was still practicing as a doctor, as well as his work with Clift, was summoned, and they were engaged by the end of the year. Caroline was three years older than Richard, small, attractive, and full of life. She told the diarist Caroline Fox that her education had been very much left to herself. She said, I determined to get to myself as much knowledge as possible. So I studied languages, even Russian, music, drawing, and comparative anatomy. My father being curator at the college, I had great facilities for this latter branch. She was fluent in German, and appears to have had a wonderfully waspish turn of praise, as if this, this appraisal she gave to Miss Fox of the great French comparative anatomist, Georges Cuvier. She said, an infinitely great man, so great indeed that you could never approach him without feeling your own inferiority. And Caroline Fox beautifully described Caroline as a very perfect little fact in the great history of the world. In 1832, Richard wrote a passionate letter to her, saying that what he felt for her was almost more than love. How's that for a phrase? All the evidence from their letters is that they adored each other, but their marriage nearly never happened. There's no evidence that William Clift had any objection to the marriage, but his wife, also Caroline, most certainly, she, most certainly did. She forbade their marriage or even acknowledgement of their engagement until Richard was earning enough to keep Caroline in the manner to which her mother aspired. It was to be a wait of eight years. Owen's family had no money and Owen had nothing apart from what he earned. Lack of an adequate income or the fear of it cast its shadow over Owen's whole life. In an attempt to improve his finances, in January 1830, apparently on the spur of the moment, he applied for a job as a house surgeon at the Birmingham Hospital. He pressed Clift and others for references and seems to have rushed off for interview almost immediately. 
But this is a draft of Cliff's letter. His affection and respect for Richard's abilities are very evident. His, his writing is very clear, so I think you can actually read quite a lot of it. When Owen arrived in Birmingham, he found both salary and prospects much poorer than he'd hoped. And although he most probably would have been offered the post, he withdrew. He also could not bear the separation. As he wrote to William Clift, my heart yearns towards the happy fields, by which he meant Lincoln Binfields. Though I had but an hour's sleep, I dreamt of you all. And Owen added with a self-awareness that would have surprised his later enemies, that he was ashamed of causing so much trouble about my stupid self. He returned to the Royal College of Surgeons in London, determined to prove himself to Caroline and to convince her mother of his worth. To Caroline, he wrote, the die is cast. You shall be with me ever and guide and prompt and see my exertions. And immediately they were prodigious. He threw himself into his cataloguing work at the Hunterian and gained priceless experience as lack of documentation meant he had to dissect countless different animals to identify by comparison the obscure specimens. He wrote the first of his hundreds of scientific papers, began an association with the Zoological Society of London, and dissected animals that had died in a zoo. He lectured at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, and after meeting the great comparative anatomist Georges Cuvier at the Hunterian in 1830, was invited by him to Paris the following year, and he wrote about that. Um, this is one of Owen's sketches that he drew when he was in Paris. I think it's really charming, and this little notebook is full of sketches like that. But Caroline and Richard were now constantly together, with still no possibility of marriage. Owen had left his lodgings and moved in with the Cliffs at the college, paying 15 pounds a quarter for board and lodging. In spite of everything, Mrs. Cliff's opposition to the match only increased and led, as Caroline wrote, to disagreement and unhappiness. For Caroline, bright, passionate and independent, the situation became so unbearable, she left and went to stay in Southampton, hoping that would restore harmony to what had been an exceptionally loving and happy home. And this wonderful letter is from January 1813. It was written by her parents to Caroline and her brother William when they were very young. And it makes it clear what a close family they were. And the letter is mainly written by Caroline Cliff, by the mother. But the kisses were written by William. Um, so each child has got six kisses. There's something very modern about this letter. And all this makes what happened to the adult Caroline so shocking. Her letters home from her self-imposed exile in Southampton, at first her restrained, but her mother's continued obduracy provoked in May 1832 an unrestrained outpouring of anguish from Caroline. She wrote to her mother that she has suffered more than even you can imagine, and she wants only to procure them a return of domestic harmony and comfort. She had left London in the hope that her absence might bring a change for the better, she wrote, for as to remaining in the state we've been living in for some time past, it is not only unnecessary cruelty to all, but impossible, for no mind could much longer bear up against it. Furthermore, she was tired of keeping her engagement a secret, particularly, as she said, it's pretty well known to some, and would be rather to my credit than disgrace. And she ends forlornly, I do not ask you to give my love to our own, except you are on such terms as to do it agree agreeably yourself, and if so, I send it freely. Her mother was unmoved. Owen's letters are full of support and love, his plans to earn a bigger income, and they seem even to contemplate secretly marrying. That plan came to nothing. But in September 1832, a tragedy occurred that ultimately resolved all their difficulties. On the evening of September the 11th, Caroline's brother was gravely injured when returning home by cab. Whether the cab overturned or whether William fell as he was getting out isn't clear, but he was rushed to St. Bartholomew's Hospital where he was received by Owen. 
He'd fractured the base of his skull and nothing could be done. It was, of course, devastating for his parents and sister, and indeed for Owen, who'd been a good friend. But his death gave Richard and Caroline their longed-for opportunity. William had been destined to, see to, su to succeed his father as conservator at the museum. That future was now Richard's, and as his salary slowly increased, so eventually were Mrs. Cliff's objections removed, though that took nearly another three years. Had she any remaining doubts about Owen's prospects, in 1834, not only was he appointed Professor of Comparative Anatomy at Bath's, but he was also elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. Caroline and Richard married at St Pancras Church, Euston Square, on July the 20th, 1835, his 31st birthday, and Caroline by then was 34. As Caroline recorded in her diary, the Reverend Mr. Lang came immediately after we got into the vestry, and, Caroline Cliff having been lost on the road, Mrs. Richard Owen returned to breakfast at Number 1 Euston Grove, her parents' home at the time. They honeymooned in Oxford. Mrs. Cliff travelled part of the way with them, and then, as she told them, found it hard to let them go. I looked on, she wrote, as long as my neck and the turn of the road would let me, until your chase was out of sight. And then I had a good cry and a glass of ale. Richard and Caroline started married life in an apartment in the Royal College of Surgeons. For Caroline, it was as much a part of a day's work to draw from a specimen, a wombat's brain, as to translate an article in German for her husband, or to read aloud from Cuvier, while Richard compared the editions. Not infrequently, they would still be correcting proofs at three in the morning. When dead animals were brought to, the, to her home for Richard to dissect, she dealt with that too, even a rather large one that had come from a famous traveling zoo. She wrote, the defunct rhinoceros, later Wombwell's menagerie, arrived while I was out. I told the men to take it right to the end of the long passage, where it now lies. As yet, I feel indifferent, but when the pie is opened and she lets the thought lie unfinished. The arrival from the London Zoo a few years later of a defunct elephant, I can't guarantee that's the same one, uh, was even more troublesome, as Caroline wrote. It made me keep, all, uh, she had to keep all the windows open, especially as the weather is very mild. I got R to smoke cigars all over the house. Many of the defunct animals from the zoo were sent to Owen. The microscope was a part of home life. Her diary records a typical evening at home shortly after their marriage. Richard spent the evening in examining some of the minute worms found in the muscle of a man. I looked at one or two through the microscope. I could not get over the smell. But R only laughed and assured me that in comparison to what surgeons often had to meddle with, it was quite sweet. Caroline and Richard had just one child, William, born on October the 6th, 1837. Far from being confined to a nursery, from, from a very young age, he seems to have met many of the Owens' visitors. Caroline records, and this may be something you would never have associated with Owen, that in February 1838, two of the great natural history collectors of the time, Lord Cole and Philip Edgerton, dropped in, she wrote, and were much amused to find Richard with a baby on his knees trying to feed him surreptitiously out of a bottle, not quite the usual image of Professor Owen. When he was first appointed the first permanent Hunterian professor at the Royal College of Surgeons in 1837, Owen had to deliver a course of 24 lectures a year. He would rehearse them to Caroline, who timed them. Both were nervous before the first one on May the 1st, and Richard took some egg and wine beforehand. At five o'clock, Caroline wrote, a great noise of clapping made me jump. All went off as well as even I could wish. The theatre crammed, and there were many who could not get places. R was more collected than he or I ever supposed, and gave this awful first lecture almost, almost, to his own satisfaction. But he was more nervous than he appeared, he called the lectures a severe trial, 
And after one on the 30th of May, Caroline wrote, are oh, very queer on coming back from lecture. If he's not better by the next one, I shall try and get it postponed. By the seventh lecture, he was confident enough to perform entirely without notes, using diagrams to illustrate his points. But the continuing stress of what they called this formal and therefore somewhat awful affair before a distinguished and critical audience made his wife fear for his health. Eventually, the nerves subsided and on being congratulated on his clear and distinct delivery, Richard replied, I always picked out the person whom I saw was in the worst place in the room for hearing, and then I talked at him. Owen's skills by now were, were remarkable. In 1836, Charles Darwin, when he returned from his voyage on the Beagle, came to Owen to ask him to describe his collection of fossil mammals. Darwin became a regular visitor to the Royal College and to Owen's apartment there. In 1839, Owen famously was sent from New Zealand a six inch fragment of bone, this is it, and from it he described a large flightless bird that was larger, heavier and more sluggish than the ostrich. Yet there was no evidence that such a bird had ever existed. Using his formidable skills as an anatomist, he compared the bone fragment with 14 other species, from an ox to man to a giant tortoise, and taking in an ostrich and a kangaroo on the way, before he made his confident assertion that this was a new species of bird. Four years later, he was sent complete bones that confirmed his identification. The moa, or Dinornis, was to become the iconic symbol of Owen's brilliance. His ability to conjure from fragments the likeness of great extinct beasts that had once inhabited the earth. By the 1840s, his fame was established and he was very much a society figure. Science may have been at the heart of it all, but Caroline and Richard's lives were extraordinarily rounded. Both were talented musicians. Caroline was a pianist. Richard played the cello and the flute and had a fine singing voice. They were, when work allowed, constantly entertaining or being entertained. In addition to Dickens, his friends included Lord Tennyson, the poet, the painter J.M.W. W. Turner, the historian Thomas Carlyle, the explorer David Livingstone, Napoleon's nephew, Charles Louis Bonaparte, who played on the floor with their baby son, William, and the opera singer, Jenny Lind. They devoured novels and spent as many evenings as possible at the concerts or the theatre. Even there, Richard's workload could intervene. When to see Martin Chuzzlewit's dramatist Martin Chuzzlewit dramatized, Caroline wrote in August 1844. <coughs> Whilst waiting in the pit, R corrected a proof and did some more before the curtain went up. And this is the playbill of that production. Sir Robert Peel, the Prime Minister, who admired him greatly, offered him a knighthood, which he declined. But Peel did secure for him a civil list pension to augment his Hunterian salary. Queen Victoria granted him a grace and favour home, Sheen Lodge in Richmond Park. Owen was also the first recipient of an honorary degree from Cambridge, and awards from British and international institutions showered down on him. At the age of 40, he'd been made a member of the exclusive literary organisation founded by Samuel Johnson, known as The Club. Owen kept a list of members from one year, which shows that in addition to Owen, there were three dukes, five earls, the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Gladstone, one Marquess, six barons, nine knights, and Mr. Alfred Tennyson, as he then was. For nearly 40 years, Caroline and Richard enjoyed a marriage of partners and equals. She is with him at many of the great occasions. She was there at the opening of the Great Crystal Palace at Sydenham, when Owen and Waterhouse Hawkins are among those presented to Queen Victoria. This is the most wonderful photograph. It is from June 1854 at the opening of the Crystal Palace. Um, the Queen is somewhere at the middle of that platform and somewhere in that throng there um, is, is Richard Owen. It was a suitably glittering occasion, but it was not without its problems. As Caroline records in her diary, the crowds were tremendous. On the way there, they met the computer pioneer and mathematician, Charles Babbage, who traveled by train with them. When they arrived at the palace, 
In a scene that sounds all too familiar today, Caroline wrote, R could not find his ivory ticket when he left home this morning, and the official at the turnstile would not let him in, in spite of Babbage offering to prove his identity. With the possibility of Britain's greatest living naturalist being left to stand outside, Babbage managed to find, as Caroline wrote, some person of importance who recognised R at once, and so we got in, finally. Among the people they met were Mr and Mrs Charles Darwin, and Caroline records, we walked about a bit with them. Just five years later, relations between Owen and Darwin were irretrievably broken, and his conflict with Darwin heralded the beginning of Owen's slow eclipse. By 1856, Owen had been employed by the Royal College of Surgeons for 29 years, and their relationship had grown increasingly fractious. He was paid 500 pounds a year, which made his civil list pension all the more welcome. A suggestion from the college to reduce his salary to save costs was noted by the Times with amazement mingled with disgust. It was the historian, Thomas Babington Macaulay, a trustee of the British Museum, whom indirectly we have to thank for the creation of the Natural History Museum. It was through his efforts that Owen finally moved to the BM when he did. In February 1856, Macaulay wrote to a fellow trustee, advocating that the role of superintendent of all the natural history departments be created specifically for Owen. Macaulay wrote, I cannot but think that this arrangement would be beneficial in the highest degree to the museum. I am sure it will be popular. I must add that I am extremely desirous that something should be done for Owen. I hardly know him to speak to. His pursuits are not mine. But his fame is spread over Europe. He is an honour to our country. And it is painful to me to think that a man of his merit should be approaching old age amid, amidst anxieties and distresses. And Macaulay goes on. He told me that 800 a year without a house in a museum would be opulence to him. And he did not, he said, even wish for more. Owen seems to me to be a case for public patronage. Macaulay was right that Owen's appointment was beneficial to the museum, but it was certainly not popular, either with the keepers of the natural history departments who considered his post unnecessary, or with those in the wider scientific community who did not want to see any extension of Owen's influence. But Owen, however, at last had the financial security he craved. As he noted in his autobiographical notebook, and I've marked it there with the arrow, his salary was 800 pounds per annum, pension 200 pounds. And he adds, a man should be strong at 30, wise at 40, rich at 50, or will never be. And Owen at this stage was 52. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Owen, with no private income, was reliant on his salary and maintaining his position in society was of immense importance to him. For the next 25 years, Owen devoted himself to creating a separate museum for the Natural History Department of the British Museum. It was something he'd first advocated in the 1840s when he suggested to the then Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel, that the collections of the Hunterian could be combined with what he called the recent and fossil zoology of the British Museum Peel's resignation halted the idea, but now Owen lobbied tirelessly. And this is a plan he drew in 1859, and it's just as he signed it in the corner, um, of his concept for a new museum. And he submitted it to Parliament through the BM trustees. In 1863, Parliament agreed to the purchase of land in South Kensington. When Owen was asked to state his requirements for the new museum, he is said to have replied, I shall want space for 70 whales, to begin with. At Easter 1881, the British Museum of Natural History opened to the public and immediately became known as the Natural History Museum. And this picture is actually how Alfred Waterhouse, the architect, wanted it to look. Uh, as you may have noticed, the wings down the side were never actually built but it was yet another extraordinary achievement for Owen, and it was to be his last. 
1883, he retired, aged 79. He was awarded a knighthood, and he was also promised a pension by the museum trustees, equal to his full salary of 800 pounds. The treasury, however, had other ideas, and citing his service with, with the Royal College of Surgeons, reduced the British Museum pension to 500. On the back of the treasury memo, Owen has scrawled, retiring allowance, British Museum, 500 pounds per annum. And in fact, that was boosted by another 100 pounds at the intervention of William Gladstone. In retirement at Sheen Lodge, Owen continued to write, but his originality had gone. And in those years it had taken for his great plan of a Museum of Natural History to reach completion, Owen had been devastated by the death of Caroline. In March 1873, he'd returned from a visit to Egypt to find her seriously ill. She lingered for a few weeks, but on May the 7th, she died. Three days later, Owen wrote to his, to her, to his sister, we have just returned from my dear Caroline's last resting place on earth, in the quiet, peaceful churchyard of Ham, a sweet summer's day. Should I be called away here, I should desire to rest by her side. Caroline's death left Richard an increasingly lonely figure. As he wrote to his old friend, William White Cooper, the world fades as one ages, like a receding landscape. Even the opening of the museum in 1881 could not rejuvenate his former energies. And then, in 1886, he received another devastating blow, the apparent suicide of their 48-year-old son, William. A policeman in Windsor had noted at 4, at 4 a.m. on a Sunday morning a hat, purse, two bunches of keys, a scarf and some gloves on the steps of the town hall, which was near the river. The hat was William's. Some hours later, his body was found in the Thames. What prompted him to do it, we don't know. From the references to William in the biography, as far as we can tell, Caroline and Richard seem to have been loving, supportive parents. William did not inherit his father's interests or brilliance. He was a junior clerk at the Foreign Office. For Richard, it seems to have been a total shock. He invited William's widow with her seven children to come and live at Sheen Lodge. And this is Richard with his granddaughter, and we think that might be Francis, who gave the three volumes of Rowan correspondence to Temple University. The family were permitted to remain at Sheen Lodge long after Richard's death. In 1890, he had a stroke. He became quite deaf. By mid 1892, he couldn't get up. I feel no pain at all, he told his doctor but I have no desire to rise from this bed. By mid-December, he could no longer recognize his family, and he died on Sunday, December the 18th, 1892. He was buried on December the 23rd in Ham Churchyard, alongside his beloved Caroline, as he'd requested. By the time of Richard Owen's death, he was scarcely remembered. There were substantial obituaries in the Times and other newspapers and journals, but he lived so long, there were few who remembered the charismatic Owen at the height of his powers, or could recollect his astonishing ability to imagine, create, discover, and order so much that was new from such a mass of material. The man who gave us dinosaurs achieved that through his ability to make great intellectual leaps in the understanding of the formula of the past and indeed the present. And that surely is the basis on which Owen should be remembered and judged. That and his glorious legacy that is this museum. And perhaps the last word should go to Caroline. Many years earlier, she talked to Caroline Fox about Richard, and she said, I determined I would never love any but a very superior man. And see how fortunate I've been. Thank you for that, Carolyn. Um, we've got time for a few questions. Oh, now more people have come in.
Um, we've got time for a few more questions before we uh, go, all go upstairs. Uh, we are actually recording the session today, so if you could wait until I get to you with the microphone. I've got a question that'd be great. Any questions? That's good. <laughs> There's just one letter about Huxley on which Sherburn, who when he went when he went through the papers, has actually written on it. This is the only letter that he Sherburn has ever known where Owen is so critical of somebody, um, and Owen is actually pretty critical of the way that Huxley has been treating him. Um, I mean, I can't say that I've read every single letter. There are thousands of them, um, so I can't answer your question directly. But it's not obvious. It doesn't leap out at you. Um, the man who's done more work than any, anybody on the Owen correspondence is Jacob Gruber, the American, um, whose um, Owen commemoration is a brilliant book. I mean, I do recommend if you want to find out about Owen's correspondence. Um, and he doesn't really point that out. I mean, Owen is very protective of, him, of himself, and that comes out. And his own priority, what he perceives to be his priority. Um, but there are few direct criticisms. Yeah, some of his criticisms. Absolutely, absolutely. Eleanor at the front. Is Thanks. First of all, thank you. Um, I think you brought them to life in, in a remarkable way, um, which I've seen you do with other historical characters. So thank you very much for that. Um, I, I have uh, two questions. Um, one is about the knighthood that was offered the first time around, and he said no. Yes. And then later he said yes. Yep. And what was behind that? And then um, a sorry. Second question um, that might be a little bit related, but um, you alluded to what I call the the Sherborne sift, um, which I know a little bit more about, where Sherborne threw away a lot of the papers. He did. Um, taking his own initiative mm -hmm. and. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about what you think might have been lost uh, in that and whether you think that was... Oh, it's heartbreaking. Um, just, up, just on the knighthood, Owen turned it down because he wasn't ready for it. He himself said he doesn't want it yet. He didn't want it yet. He thought it was too soon in his career, which is sort of quite remarkable. But as for uh, the, what Sherbin... Sh you've got to be... Sh what Sherbin did was extraordinary. Um, he, uh, he saved this correspondence when Owen left um, the museum, uh, the, all his papers followed him in two huge cartloads, and they were stored in a stable at Sheen Lodge, and they were damp, and they were being chewed by rats. So Sherburn comes along, and he goes through them, but his, his, his priority was extracting the ones with a scientific, what he perceived to be a scientific value. So anything that he thought was trivial or not directly relevant to what was in the museum he threw away. And I mean, that is just extraordinary and heartbreaking. But Owen had never thrown anything away. So there was, I mean, there was, the stuff was just piled up. It was the most extraordinary job to try and organize this material. So Sherman did a fantastic job from that point of view. But yes, I mean, quite clearly, we, we've lost some fabulous material. But the worst loss are the Caroline diaries. And it's thought that there might have been Owen diaries as well. Um, and as I said, they were, they were last seen in America 20, 30 years ago, um, and they've just vanished. But I sort of rather hope that somebody one day might open a drawer and find them. Hi. Um, hello. Hello. Can you share us um, anything about his descendants or William's descendants? Um, 
grandchildren. There were seven grandchildren, yes, and actually I'm in touch with the, uh, some of the great-great-grandchildren who look remarkably, I mean, Frances Herzl, I mean, I have a friend now who's, who's great-great-granddaughter, she's identical to the granddaughter, so it's a very strong gene that has come down through the Owen line. Um, but not one of them showed any, any interest whatsoever in science, which is extraordinary in itself. Um, did any one of them, this is on now, <laughs> yeah, um, did any one of them show interest on like your research or any other people's research in um, Owen's life? What, from the, from, with the relatives? Yes. Um, yes, they're all interested in it and they, they're all sort of digging around in ancestry and trying to find out stuff about him, but nothing really new has, has emerged yet, but you never know. But sadly, they don't have anything. I mean, you know, there's no trunk in the attic that contains wonderful materials, very sadly. You've written a number of articles in Evolve. When are you writing a book about him? <laughs> uh, not this week. It's a very difficult subject to write about. I mean, there should be. A biography, but I'm not quite sure how you pitch it. The relationship between him and Caroline is obviously wonderful, and you can write a really interesting book or maybe a novel about that. Um, he had such a huge and complicated life, and a lot of his philosophical and theological ideas are so complicated that you could never put them across in any meaningful way to a general audience, and it's difficult enough for one who, for an audience that isn't general. Um, you only have to look at Nicholas Rupka's book to realize that. So, um, I don't know, the jury's out. <laughs> and actually, I can probably shout um, <laughs> rather than have to read them. Um, I just want to actually, what Helen was just saying, a book on Owen as a human being is much overdue because we have all this Darwin hagiography, and a lot of people in this institution, for example, are fairly unaware of the real interactions that happened between people like Owen and Darwin. Yeah. And for me, one of my hobby horses around the museum that's unbelievably unpopular and is never going to happen is it irritates me constantly that we have to look at the smug savant of down, looking down from the central <laughs> stairs, while Owen is stuck on, on, at the back of a balcony. Staring at Huxley. Exactly. It's when ludicrous. Owen was actually uh, unbelievably productive. Yep. If it weren't for him, we wouldn't have this place, and Owen's found a job. And also, very few people here realise that Darwin actively lobbied for this place not to be built. Indeed. And behind right. Owen's, Owen's back out spot. Yes. Um, and then putting Darwin in front of the place of really irritates. <laughs> yes, I, I, did, I did have a meaningful discussion with somebody um, about it, and um, apparently it would cost something like £35,000 to move Owen back to the top of the staircase. But it's obviously much more than that, and that is that he is not to play for the decade. Um, and Darwin is, you know, Saint Saint Charles, which is very sad, which is not good for either of them. Maybe you should have both. Well, the interesting comparison is that Owen is often criticised for writing anonymous reviews. Absolutely, and Darwin was worse. Darwin, exactly. If Darwin could have taken exception, he would. And what is even worse is Owen, at least, all right, Owen wrote anonymous reviews, but you could tell who's written them. But Darwin does all this privately, and he feeds it all through Huxley and, and, and his other friends. So Darwin is sort of sitting there, and he's pulling the strings. Um, and poor old Owen doesn't have that backup. He hasn't got anybody to fight for him. It's really, no, it's, it's really sad, but I'm, I'm absolutely with you that he really does deserve um, to be forefront, but it's quite difficult, I would imagine, finding a publisher. So, so should we have a, 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 a modern sculpture put in the front of the museum, big? So that it's bigger than Darwin out in the front of the museum, so you see it when you walk in? Oh, I think the bronze sculpture would just do. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that, one's, that one's dark and it doesn't, it wouldn't hold mm. place wherever you to a, oh, yes, a I mean, why not commission a, a new, so a new one, one. Yes, where he looks rather nicer yes. and not so scary? Yeah. Okay, so thank you again, Carla. That was fascinating. And Carla will be joining us in DC2 for a few drinks if anyone wants to, you know, plan a future HBO series on. Uh, <laughs> now, there's a good idea. <laughs> thank you.